Shalom Aleichem everybody, welcome back to Torah, a warm welcome to the Yibbana Beit Midrash, welcome home to Torah. We are not in the regular Kliakar this week, but we are using the Kliakar uh, to discuss Shavuos, the upcoming holiday, and we are in a book called the Olos Ephraim, written by Shlomo Ephraim Miluncic, and here we go. We are going to deal with a, with a verse in... Uh, Numbers 28, verse 26, which describes something about the day. It says, Ubiyom habikurim, on the day that you bring your first fruit offerings, Bahak rivchem, when you offer them up, as a mincha chadasha, a mincha chadasha, a new meal offering, la Hashem, it's to Hashem. Uh, on your festival of weeks and that's what we're going to be dealing with and um, the big question that the Kliakar is going to ask is something that we should have asked and we did ask and we did talk about but anybody who's listening would know to ask on Rosh Hashanah we know that is Yom HaDin it's the day of judgment and yet nowhere does it say clearly in the Torah that the um, the day of Rosh Hashanah is the day of judgment, the great judgment day. However, bring it back to this, on Shavuos, isn't it Mat and Torah? Aren't we celebrating the giving of the Torah, the receiving of the Torah, somehow or another, the, re the actual revelation itself where we receive the Torah? Isn't that what Shavuos is all about? And yet the verses, nowhere is it clearly stated in the entire t in t uh, five books of Moses, that this is the day that we receive the Torah. The, aside from the fact there's no date, which we're not going to deal with tonight, there's no specific date, that's part of you know, understanding this, but that it doesn't refer to it. The Torah itself does not refer to Shavuos as the day of Matin Torah. Keeping that in mind, one, let me just give, I don't want to spoon feed you, but I do want to give you this idea that if it's Yom HaDin is Rosh Hashanah, and God wants us to constantly think about doing tshuva, not sinning, and doing the right thing, so if we thought of it, or the Torah said specifically that that was the day, what is the likelihood? Human nature will delay any kind of tshuva, will sin the whole year, and then maybe the month before, maybe the week before, or maybe during the 10 days of tshuva, we'll just concentrate on doing tshuva. And that's not what God wants. God wants us to constantly be involved in the concept of tshuva and therefore plug that same idea, overlap that idea. So the Kliakar actually wants us to think in the same framework that the receiving of the Torah should be every single day. We shouldn't only think about one particular day that we receive the Torah, but the very fact that the Torah does not tell us that was the day we received the Torah. In fact, there are other verses that say, Hayom, we'll discuss that, that every single day we should consider receiving the Torah. And with that brief introduction, let us begin with the Kliakar's introduction. I'm going to just refer to him as the Kliakar, although we know we're referring to the Olos of Rhyme. <laughs> He begins with this brief introduction. Tam, well, actually, he just quoted the verse I did. Tam le'alam yom matin Torah b'Torah. The reason, this is like the, the paragraph that sums up, the reason for the hidden nature, meaning the, that it's somehow hidden, this idea of the day of the giving of the Torah in the Torah itself. So, Amra Katuv, we read the verse, very nice. So, after we're reading the verse, Terem, Boi libayer parshiot yom kodesh zeh, the hasoidois elukiot. Before I begin to explain the parshiot, the different paragraphs that deal with this holy day, then there are sodos elukiot, there are godly secrets. 
Hanir Mazim that are hinted at. Bekol Hamas Maasim Hanaasim Bachag Zeh. That that we ourselves are involved. First of all, I should say, it's hinted at. There's actually hints to all the different actions that we perform on this holiday. Ri'iti lahatir safek gado, and therefore I see fit to try to resolve and to uh, release any kind of doubt or great doubt one might have. Asher nevucho bo hakedmonim, in which the earlier sages may have been per perplexed. This is a great question. Why is it that the very day of Matan Torah is not mentioned, uh, meaning a date, or that the Hag HaSukos is related specifically to Matan Torah? Sheze Amar Bacho Bacho. And many of them had, you know, different answers. Some like this, some like that. V'huma Shemetzinu HaTorah Lo Hizkiru B'Shum Makom Shahag Zeh Hu Yom Matan Torah that this was their question, the very fact that we don't find in the Torah itself, Bishum Makom, that this Chag is the festival for the giving of the Torah. Ki'im Yom Ha Bikorim. You know what the day is known as? The day of bringing your first fruits. What is so unique? What does that hint to us? <coughs> Sorry. What is the Torah trying to get across? What's the message about first fruits that is so significant that relates perhaps to the whole idea of Matan Torah? And he says, Ki im yom hakipurim levad. It seems like that's the only um, uh, description. Vim hag hamatzos, if you think about Passover, which is called hag hamatzos, shehu shichrur hagufot. When we think about Pesach, the leaving of Egypt, we're thinking about a physical freedom. Hitzi v'chereshbarchu tziyunim. Hashem has set up markers. Liomahu, for that particular day, and let's say that week. V'higbilu b'tesvav l'chodesh. And uh, either limited or defined on that particular day, the 15th of the month. U'chishah mitzvah al hagigato. Biur v'mekomo and the... The, the obligation to, to the mitzvah, the command regarding the festival is clearly explained in its place. Hasiba hamichoyevet, with uh, clear objectives or um, specific reasons even, hagigato, for why we're celebrating Pesach. We left Egypt. How many mitzvahs? How many times were we reminded? And how many times a day? We have actually an obligation. Part of the 613 mitzvahs is to know and, rem and remind yourself um, that Hashem took you out of Egypt. So if that's true by, by, by Pesach, Kal v'choymer, sh'yigbul yom meyuchad lahag lezecher netinat Torah. How much more so, in other words, shouldn't it be logical to think if the Torah went ahead and defined and, and, and um, explained so clearly about the physical leaving of Egypt, shouldn't the Torah have uh, clearly defined this unique festival that was in order to remember the giving of the Torah, which is so fundamental to us Jews. Shuzman Shikro Nafashos. This is where our souls found freedom. Our physical body found freedom at Pesach, at, during the holiday of Pesach. But what about the spiritual redemption, uh, spiritual freedom that we find through the Torah, the day the Torah was given itself? Afapi. Shabohi inyan berevach or beruach. Let's say beruach. Even though this idea is coming with the spirit of the idea is being uh, uh, conveyed, kamo shetziva lekadesh shanat hachamishim. Just think about it. We have the jubilee year. Just as we are commanded to sanctify that fiftieth year, shehu shikur hagufot, in which. Slaves are let free and physical uh, property, you know, the real estate property goes back to its original owner. So that's a physical freedom that we're experiencing. And Likro to Dror Ba'aretz, as we know that liberty is proclaimed throughout the land, as it says on the Philadelphia Liberty Bell. And it's a quote, it's a quote from Vayikra. 
כך ציווה לקדש יום החמישים. So too, Hashem himself commanded us that we should also sanctify the 50th day, Shuhu Shikrur Hanafashos. This is the day of the, the freedom of our souls, or for our souls. Nevertheless, Mikol Makom, Yishal El Hashoel, the question begs to be asked, why? Why, right? Lama, Lo tizkira Torah beferush inyan zeh. Why does the Torah neglect? Why does it hide? Why does it not mention specifically or explicitly this idea? So the clear car says one more sentence. Veriti beheter she'elazu pani mi panim shonois. I have seen the ability to answer or to resolve this question in many different ways, and it goes on for chapters. But we're only going to deal with. This one particular mimer, I just for those who are watching, it's mimer kuflam uh, tet one thirty nine. Bezrat Hashem. Next week we'll continue with another very interesting mimer about chalav. Why do we eat and drink? Why do we have a lot of cheesecake, dairy, on uh, on Shavuos? I just want you to look at the first page again when it says mimcha uh, chadasha. The word chadasha starts with a chet. La Hashem Bishvotechem. The Reishi Tevos, the acronym for Chet Lamid Bet, is Chalav. Anyway, that is like just a, uh, a teaser for next week. Okay, so the next paragraph begins. Ani Chelki Liyomer. I am going to give a partial answer. I'm going to begin to answer part of the major question. Shiyom ze doyma mamash liyom din shel hagufot berosh hashana. Try to imagine. I mean, he'll describe why it is similar. That this day is very similar. The dome mamash to what we call the great and awesome uh, day of judgment for the bodies, anyway, at least in the physical sense in this world for Rosh Hashana. To liyom din shel hanafashos lo maba as well as to the day, as we are just going to now describe, the receiving of the Torah was actually a day of judgment on our souls. And this will be Lola Maba in the world to come, let's say forever. Kilo mitzinu zikron shneyem beferish bekol Torah. We, the similar idea is we don't find anything in the Torah specifically mentioning that Rosh Hashanah is the Yom Adin, but this day is also a Yom Adin. We also described it as uh, the, the day of the giving of the Torah, but it's also Yom Hadin. And it's not just for the Jews. I, when we read this, you'll see. I think this applies to non-Jews as well. We'll see why. Ki Rosh Hashanah lo nemar ki im yom trua yelechem. You'll see this in number uh, two on your source sheet, Numbers 29.1. It says, it shall be a day of shofar sounding to you. So that's the only description, right, by Rosh Hashanah. It doesn't call it a day of judgment. So there's no explicit uh, explanation of what we're supposed to do on that day or what, what difference is that day than any other day. And he says, with God's help, I'll be able to discuss it in its place, meaning when he discusses Rosh Hashanah, and he does. I hope everyone's on the same page with this. Nobody knows the day of their own death. Correct? Okay. David himself knew that he was going to die when he was 70. But he didn't know what day... He didn't, and he, okay, that's a whole other story. So, but most of us have no clue. We don't know. We don't know the day we're going to die. And then we'll be able to enter into this day of judgment called Rosh Hashanah. And uh, the reason that it's hidden by Rosh Hashanah is in order that a man, all his days, will be spent doing tshuva, thinking about anything he did wrong, trying to make the proper corrections, because any day you could enter the, uh, the Day of Judgment with Hashem. Shrehu mesupach bekoyom. Obviously, after the fact that you're in doubt what day you're going to die, kolzeu yom adin, then you're going to make sure that every single day you feel that it's impending to get things straight because tomorrow could be 
the judgment day. And hopefully, as a result of that, you'll stay far from sin. You won't be a Russia. You won't be an evil person. The Yeshuv Ba'achris Hayamim. In other words, Rosh Hashanah. And this is the very reason when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, the Yom Hadin, that the Torah hides this idea. Halima Torah Yom Hadin, Shagufois Rosh Hashanah. In order, Kadesh Lo Yisagel Ha'odnam Bechet. So a person won't feel uh, used to or practicing a uh, sin. <coughs> the whole year, the right? Like I described before, you're not going to wait to the last minute. You won't wait until Elul. You won't wait until the week before. You'll be trying your whole, your darnest, right? The whole year to stay right with God and do tshuva at day by day. <coughs> <clears throat> but, you know, I think he's being a little bit uh, critical of us, but we all do this, don't we? We wait until Elul. We wait until the week before. We wait until uh, the 10 days of Shuvah, not to eat Pasakum, you know, and Shemin made by uh, non-Jews. And we try to be very strict, right? Because we're going to be judged. So he goes, he says like this. Everybody thinks that they're just, that they're right in their own eyes, right? We judge ourselves. We get up in the morning, we look at ourselves and say, you're God's gift to humanity, right? And then, only towards, as we get closer and closer to Rosh Hashanah, then we get serious and we do tshuva. But the reason the Torah left it uh, hidden is so that one should always be in this doubtful situation every single day, that perhaps you're going up to uh, heaven for your final judgment. As we see in, um, you'll find this on number three, in Gemara Rosh 16a. So we do, there's a big discussion about Rosh Hashanah being the Day of Judgment, but there are other opinions. It's true, there's no doubt that Rosh Hashanah is the Day of Judgment, but Rabbi Yossi says a person is judged every day, and there's a verse in uh, Job 7.18, which actually is used for both. Even the next opinion that Rabbi Natan says a person is judged every hour. So the verse is, you visit him every morning, and the latter part of the verse is, you try him every moment. So basically the idea is that it's a multiple uh, uh, opinions about when you're judged. The truth is they're all true. We are judged all the time. Okay, the question is which one is the, the ultimate judgment. But there's a three-way maklokis. Adam, nidam, b'koyom. The truth is we should know this, that a person is judged not just every moment, uh, not just every, every day, but every moment as well. Ukemoshu inyan barosha shana shu yom Shishi. This is like something I don't know if we've all thought about deeply, but this idea is that Rosh Hashanah is what is Yom Shishi Labrius Adam. So when we say that Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the world, or the creation of the world, we don't really mean that literally. What we really mean is that that's when man was created. So the world was created five days before because man was created on the sixth day then Shabbos was the second day of life. So you have on the 25th day, which is day one, 26th day two. So by the time you get to the sixth day, that's the first day of the month of Tishrei. Rosh Hashanah is the first, like it's a new moon, it's the first day of the new month of Tishrei. And so that's day six of creation. And that is the time that man is judged every single year. But think about it, we always think about it as the first day of the year. It's the first day of creation. It's really the sixth day of creation. So it's Yom HaShishi. And I want to take you, I'm not sure we're not we're there yet, but... Um, it's the first day of human history. That's tr correct, the first day of human history. If you look at uh, number five, it says in Genesis 1, uh, verse 31, God saw all that he had made, he already judged then. That's a judgment call. And behold, it was very good. And it was evening and it was morning. Yom Hashishi. 
You don't have a hey before all the other days. Yom Echad, Yom Sheni, Yom Shlishi. But Yom Hashishi. What do you have a definitive hey? It's a hey hayadiyah. Okay, that's a means like, it's like capital T-H-E. The sixth day. There's something unique and special about the sixth day. So I want you to look at the Rashi there. Scripture added a hey on the sixth day at the completion of creation to tell us that he stipulated with them, meaning with creation. You were created. All of creation was created on the condition. I'm going to just change it, the word uh, just for a second. That somebody <laughs> will accept the five books of the Torah. God knew it was going to be the Jews, but he did ask everybody, and they all turned it down. And that's why I think this is really a judgment day as well for all the non-Jews. The non-Jews, to be a righteous non-Jew and go to heaven, part of that is the acceptance of the very fact that the seven laws were reiterated, stated again at Mount Sinai. Meaning our tradition is Adam received six commandments, Noah received one more, the seventh, but that's not enough. God reiterated, he gave the Torah to the world, the Torah for the Jews, which is the Torah that we have, and we have to keep it, God is addressing the Jewish people, as well as the nation should understand that God is addressing the Jewish people. We are the Kohanim, we are the priests, and we're going to discuss this as we go along. So there's something unique about this experience for a Noahide to also truly understand, because he has to understand that they're from God, as opposed to a smart non-Jew, and he'll be blessed in this world. If he comes to the conclusion that it's healthy lifestyle to live a moral life, it's um, you know, progressive, it's, it's just good for mankind, it makes the world a better place, he will be blessed in this world. But <laughs> he may not and will not see the world to come if he doesn't believe in God and the God, that God gave the Torah. So I see Yom Matan Torah also relating a judgment day to the non-Jews as well. Let's continue. Um, so therefore, what was happening... The, num the numerical value of hey is five. So Yom Hashishi, even though it's on the sixth day that the five books were given over to the world, so that the whole world was actually waiting in ambience, like in limbo. If nobody accepted the Torah, if the Jews did not accept the Torah, the world would revert back to nothingness. Another explanation for the sixth day, the works of creation were all suspended until the sixth day. Which is the sixth day? The sixth of Sivan, the very day that we're referring to. Referring to the sixth day of Sivan, which was prepared for the giving of the Torah. The He is the definitive article alluding to the well-known sixth day, the sixth day of Sivan, when the Torah was given. I might have jumped ahead, but let's continue back into the Kliyakar. So before the creation of man, Kikodem Briyas Adam. There was no place for any kind of judgment. Not in the, amongst the angels. First of all, they have no free will. Angels are perfectly in line with God's will. They do exactly what he says. And there is no judgment for them because they have no free will. And guess what? Lions and tigers and bears, they're murderers, they're robbers, they, they do all kinds of immoral acts. No, we don't think of it that way. That is instinct. There is no judgment below us. We are the ones that are being judged. Kiyom shishi besivan hu yom din. The very day that we're describing coming up soon called Shavuos is judgment day. That's right, it's the sixth day. Ki bo haya nidon ha'olam klali prati. Because on that day, the world is judged in two levels. In a general way, klali, and in a very specific way, or in individual way, as we will discuss. Like it says uh, in Chazal, you'll find this in Gemara Vodah Zara, and I think I have it here on number four. Um, basically, it actually just says what I told you before, that if the Jewish people would not have accepted the Torah... Um, I'll just refer to Jeremiah 33.25. The Gomorrah mentions that um, God said basically the testimony of heaven and earth uh, will, will basically um, uh, attest to this. 
It says in Jeremiah 33, 25, If my covenant be not day, be not with day and night, I would not have appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth. So heaven and earth would cease to exist, perhaps. Rabbi Shem ben Lakish even asked, What does it mean on the verse we just described in Genesis 131? And there was evening and morning the sixth day? So the Torah tells us that the Holy One blessed be established a condition with the acts of creation. He made... Con uh, all of creation stipulated by this. If the Jewish people would not accept, if the people would accept my Torah at the revelation on Sinai, well then everything is great. And if not, I'm going to return you back to the primordial, primordial state of chaos and disorder. So we have to take it seriously. If we learn Torah or study Torah or make it a priority in our life, the world exists and will continue to exist. And if we don't, not good. Okay, so basically it says Yom Ashishi. We talked about that. Kulechem Tluyim Ad Yom Shishi B'Sivan. The entire universe is hanging in abeyance until that sixth day of Sivan, which Baruch Hashem we said we would accept. We still have to continue. Hereisha Olam Tluyim B'Din Im Leicharev O Lechayim, and the whole world was standing uh, in a balance in judgment whether or not the world would be destroyed or continue to exist. Now that's klali. That's the overall judgment. But what about haprati? How, are, how is each person judged individually? First of all, understand that every human being is a a olam katan. Olam katan means, I'm going to say, is a miniature universe. A universe on their own. Everybody counts. But your whole world to yourself to a certain extent. So if that's true, Dahainu Adam Nikra Olam Katan, that's what we're actually called in a small world. Like it says in Chazal. Now this is going back to this idea in, in Gemar Shabbos 88a, which I do have here. But I'll try to describe it, what's happening. That what happened was Hashem took the mountain and he held it over our heads. Can you imagine? Use your imagination. And he says that if you don't accept the Torah right here and now, I'm going to bury you here under the mountain. Now there was a... Now let, let's say like this. Can someone really be forced? Right? The religious coercion? Well, if God made the stipulation before the world was created, of course. So let's say, to a certain extent, we were forced. Is that really the best case scenario? Wouldn't it be better if we had been willing to accept the Torah? Well, guess what happened at the time of Esther? Esther Hamalka. What happened? That's when we said, right? Kimu v'kimu yudim aleim. So it says over there in 927 of the uh, scroll of Esther, the Jews ordained what they had already taken upon themselves through coercion at Sinai. I mean, that's... It just means that we had accepted upon ourselves what we already accepted pri previous. But we did it willingly. Besimcha, with joy. And keep that in mind when we celebrate Purim together that we're very happy that we accepted it willingly. And that is exactly what happened. Okay. <coughs> so keep that in mind. No, we were not drunk. <laughs> okay. Kopo leim har kagigit. Right? God put over our head like a barrel or a bathtub over our head. He held the mountain over our head. And he said, Im Torah mutav. If you accept the Torah, great. V'im lav, sham kvoratchem. And if not, that will, be, you will, that will be your tomb or your burial place. So what comes out of all this? Nim hayom techilas masav. This is really the beginning of all his actions. Ki lifnim haya oilam. Because prior to this, the world was nikshav letohu below Torah. I just want to just stop for a second and explain. We have a 6,000 year cycle. The first 2,000 years we call tohu vavohu, meaning chaos and void. That's up until Abraham. By the way, Abraham was born in what year? 1948. Not this, you know, according to the Gentile calendar, but the Jewish calendar. And then 2,000 years later, the next, sorry, then the, so he, so he was from, he basically what we call him is the 2,000 years of Torah. So you have 2,000 years prior to him are chaos and void. Then you have 
2,000 years from Abraham's life onward is what we call the years of Torah. And then the last 2,000 years which we're in are called the years of Mashiach. But just keep in mind that our avos followed the Torah. What Torah? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. What Torah? The Torah wasn't given yet. Mm -hmm. So they definitely kept the seven Noahide laws for sure. The question is, and it's a big question, do they keep just, they didn't violate the negative commandments? Did they also do the positive commandments? I mean, it's, it's a good question, but we basically hold, according to may, many opinions, that they did keep not only the, the Torah laws, they even kept rabbinic laws. They were, at least Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were so spiritually sensitive that they were, and Ruach HaKodesh, that they understood what later on Chazal was able to even darshan out and draw out and make tekanas and all, all, all that kind of stuff because Rashi gives an example of a Erev Tafshilin that Avraham even kept Erev Tafshilin which is a rabbinic command. Okay, let's go on. So it comes out like this that the, that the first, the prior, to, um, prior to us receiving the Torah it was considered to, like tohu blow Torah. And I think this is my, if I understand this correctly, he's saying, It wasn't just the Jews. It's not just the Jewish people that are being judged about receiving the Torah, or not on that day. Amim is plural for nations, for other peoples. But, uh, in the Kabbalah the Torah, because the Torah itself uh, designates or proscribes reward and punishment and call Yisrael Yeshlem Chelechomba every Jew gets a place in the world to come and there is also room for non-Jews you don't have to be Jewish to come along okay so just keep so that just to reiterate that one point that I believe that every, like it says Amim everybody Rosh Hashanah itself is a day that every human being is being judged so too here that when it says Nimsa Shazay Yom Techilas Masav, it's like a, that's actually the Nusak, the words we use in our Rosh Hashanah prayers. So, too, this is like the beginning of his works. The very day of the revelation is so significant to the whole world. It's not just a Jewish thing. Mm -hmm. That whether it comes to the seven Noachai laws, whether it comes to a, a, a righteous person, whether he's righteous or just wise, there is a concept of Gemul Vaonish, of reward and punishment. And that's designated in the Torah itself. V'tam ha'elam mo'il l'shnei nanim. The very fact that it's hidden, that there's a reasons why it benefits us. It actually helps us for two reasons. Ha'echad hu hamaskil yitzar balibo. That someone who is trying to be enlightened, he says someone who is enlightened, let's say spiritually enlightened, he should imagine or create or illustrate within his heart Bekol yom, every single day. Ke'ilu hayom nitna Torah. <clears throat> as if, t very today, every day, as if, as if today the Torah was given. Just like we learn in, um, let's just say like this, uh, I'm not sure where it's, uh, in the Sifri. It brings down like this. Mesupak asher, okay, from the verse. We learn from the verse, from the Pasuk. Asher anochi mitzavecha hayom. Right? God says, I command you today. And in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 40, I command you today. That we learn from there that one should feel every single day he is being or she is being commanded. Meaning an acceptance of the Torah. That each and every single day it should be similar in your eyes or you should imagine in your own mind. Ki'ilu Kabbalah Hayom Mehar Sinai. That you should imagine to yourself that today is the receiving of the Torah from Har Sinai. Ti'etzlo Keprutgama Chadasha. Now, Prutgama is a modern word, so I don't know if it means the same thing, but it's a thing, a prototype, uh, some new thing, something new. So you should, what we should have in our minds is it's brand new. Remember we said it's a mincha chadasha. The Torah itself is new. Shalo yakutzba, and it sh you shouldn't be uh, disgusted by it or detested by it. Kedavar nityashen, as something that is growing old. Okay, now I don't know. If something is old, you mean like rotting, right? 
בפי האדם שליבו קץ בו, because that's what people usually do, they get disgusted by things that are very old and let's say deteriorating. אלא בכל יום יסמך בקודי השם ישרים, but rather each and every single day one should be overjoyed with the commands and the instructions that Hashem is giving us because they're straight. Just like we find, now listen to this amazing verse. This is in Mishlei, Proverbs 5.19. Now, I, we are going to, it's going to sound very sexual, so try to use your imagination and we won't talk about it too much. Ayelet Ahavim v'yalet chen. This verse is referring to a lovely hind and a graceful mountain goat. Her, her breast will satisfy you at all times. You shall always be intoxicated with her love. By the way, next week we're going to talk about the latter part of this verse. That's when we talk about milk. But in the meantime, we're talking about a lovely hind. Now this hind is a deer of sorts, an ayelet. So the clear car explains, ayelet ahavim ma ayelet ayela ze rachamatsar. Apparently what we're talking about is that she has a very narrow womb, or let's say a very tight place. Vachaviva al bala kol shach kesharishona, and therefore her husband is intoxicated. He's like, does such great desire has such great pleasure? Let's say uh, every every time, just like the first time. So too, if that's true, by such a uh, description of what we're talking about. So when it comes to the words of Torah, so too, for those that learn the words of Torah, they should be so pleasurable, so intoxicating, just like the very first time that we heard these words, even though we heard them many times, it's like the first time. Okay? And regarding this, there's a verse in, also in Mishlei 27.7. It talks about having, let's say, when you have a desire, like a, a cheshek for something, you're really hungry, so you can appreciate a honeycomb. But in tw Proverbs 27.7, number 8, it says, a sated soul tramples a honeycomb. Meaning, when you are satiated, you, you, unbel you probably waste a lot of things, but you don't appreciate the honeycomb, the something that's very sweet. So, he had Torah. The Torah itself is so sweet. Ah, it's so sweet. It's metucha midvash nofesufim. It's even sweeter than the sweetest honeys. And furthermore, zechira zu mo'elit shehamaskil yitzar belibo b'koyom. The furthermore, this very mentioning of what we're talking about actually benefits and helps this uh, enlightened person illustrate in their own heart each and every day as if today you're receiving the Torah and it's as if God is placing over your head this barrel or the mountain as if he's going to bury you there and as if you are being judged as if you were being judged, that God forbid if you don't follow through with what is written in it. Then this is proper that you would, let's say, regal is probably referring to the holidays themselves, or let's say standing up on your feet, so to speak. Very interesting language. The Sha'ult Metaktav. I'm going to translate Shaul as the netherworld. It does mean uh, hell, that people translate it that way, but the netherworld is down below. It's somehow getting excited because he thinks you're coming, right? If you're not going to accept the Torah every single day and ready to, um, to take on, knowing that it's a Yom Adin, you're going to be judged. So the, um, whatever that is that's living down below in the netherworld is getting, the netherworld itself is excited that you're on your way. So therefore, the sum yiras Hashem, therefore the very fact that we're talking about it this way is in order that you should recognize, it's going to help you have more awe of God. 
a recognition and God consciousness al panav in front of you labal yichatev asham in order to prevent you from sinning in order that you won't sin or be guilty of anything. Now according to this proposal that we've been discussing there's no uh, you know there's no time that is specific or limited to the, re, to the day of the giving of the Torah why? because by the enlightened one who he's thinking about this all the time and there's no greater right reason why otherwise you know, in other words there's, there's no greater reason why there should be so one should in order for one to be hunger hungry and desire the word of God think about what it says in Perkavot just to start with in Perkavot it's number 9 on the source sheet chapter 1 Mishnah 4 it's speaking about um, having your home be a meeting place for the wise. Dust yourself in the soil of their feet, but drink thirstily of their words. So it says in Hebrew, Have shota bitsema es divrehem. That's such an important thing, that the words of Torah, but it's thirst. You have such a desire to quench your thirst with the words of Torah from these sages that are around you. And um, that leads us into the next idea, and also in the future. So that's true what Perkyavot, the sages tell us to do. But if you look what it says about the future in Amos uh, 8.11. So it says over there, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, and I will send famine into the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but to hear the word of the Lord. V'hishlachti ra'ba'aretz, lo ra'av lelechem, lo tzemelamayim, that's what it's all about. So, this whole idea is a, a good sign. The people will not be hungry for regular bread, for regular food. But they will be interested in spiritual matters. Um, they will be hungry and as well as thirsty for spiritual matters. No. Remember, we asked in the very beginning, what is the special relationship to first fruits? That's the only description given? Well, guess what? Wait till you hear this. I would ask for drum rolls at this point. What in the world is Bikurim have to do with this? But this is the very reason. That's something, that's something that becomes so ripe, right? Ripens, comes first. That's, in other words, the word bechor is for the firstborn because he comes first. So it could mean ripening, quickening, coming first. So something that is quick or coming first by a man, he desires very much to swallow it while it's still in his hand. So what we're going to describe in this verse in Isaiah 28 in Isaiah 28, um, verse 4. Hear the verse. Hear the verse. And his glorious beauty shall be the, young, be the young fruit of an inferior fig, which is in the head of the valley of fatness. As a fig that ripens before the summer, that means it's ripening early, which if the seer sees it, someone's looking at it, he will swallow it while it is still in his hand, meaning it is so ripe that you don't want to even hold it for another minute. It's quickly ripening, and that's an unbelievable thing. Um, look at the Rashi, like a ripening of the young fruits of an inferior fig. In other words, it should not be ripe, but something is happening where it is. Before the summer. Summer is the time of the ripening of other figs. But because it's in its early ripening, he pounces on it and swallows it while it's still in his hand. Keep that in mind. This is the Jewish people. What do we say? Nasev and Ishma. Let's do it already. And well, then we'll understand, right? So, Netina v'netina ha-Torah nimshala l'bikurim la'am Hashem. The very giving of the Torah is going to be compared, right? Nimshala to these first fruits as the people of God. We are the people of God, the Am of Hashem. We are also 
considered like the first born. In fact, we are called the firstborn, but that's not for now. Now look in, um, it's actually Hoshaya 9.10. It was a mistake, but it says like this. In Hoshaya 9.10, it says, Like the grapes in the desert, I found Israel. God is really, you know, talking very nice about us. Like grapes in the desert, I found Israel. Like a ripe fig on a fig tree. Ready for these words? In its beginning. The Jewish people are called Bibkura. Like a ripe fig tree in its beginning. And then it says, I saw your forefathers. Keep all this in mind. Um, should we see Rashi now? Uh, like grapes in the desert. Like grapes which are precious in, the, precious in the desert. So did I love Israel. Like a ripe fig. That's what Bechura, uh, like a ripe fig on a tree. Betena. In its beginning, in the beginning of the ripening of the figs, I saw your forefathers. So did your forefathers appear in my eyes to love them. Now it says like this. After reading that verse, we said it's Birishita, that the Jewish people are considered in the beginning. So this is what it says in Breshit, the very fact that Genesis 1 1, if you actually look over there, right? Look at uh, number 13 on the source sheet. In the beginning, God's, of God's creation of the heavens and the earth. It says, Bereshit. It says, Bereshit. By the way, if you look down below, um, it teaches us the sequence of the creation. It teaches us that the sequence of the creation as written is impossible. This is not about a sequence, <coughs> but rather to teach us that God created the world for the sake of His Torah. So the Torah is called Reshit. And we have a bus, Pusik in uh, Proverbs 8.22, Reshi Tarko. And we have another um, verse in Jeremiah 2.3, where the Jewish people are called Reshi Tvuata, uh, the first of his grain. So there's something that Rashi is telling us oh, already back in Genesis, that there's a thing called Reshi. God created the world for Reshi. Reshi is the first fruit, so to speak. The Torah is Reshi, and the Jewish people are called Reshi. So let's continue with the clear car. So what says Breshit, Bishvil HaTorah. The Torah is called Reshit, as I already mentioned in, uh, in um, Proverbs 8.22. Pro is it 8.22? Right, number 14. It says, The Lord acquired me at the beginning of His way, before His works of old. We're talking about the Torah, the, the, the Reshit Darko, before He even created the world. And in Jeremiah, it's talking about the Jewish people. It says clearly, you cannot mess with this. Israel is holy to the Lord. Kodesh Yisrael la Hashem. Reshit tevuata, the first of his grain. Okay, look at Rashi. Israel is holy like truma, like truma. The first of his grain, like the first of the harvest before the omer, which is forbidden to eat, and whoever eats is liable. Fine. So here we have the reshit tevuato. Bor elukim the goimer. That when it regards both of them, meaning Israel and the Torah, so that is, regarding the truth, is both of them are judged as first and foremost. If I can just translate it that way, Reshit, Ubechura, first and foremost. Letam Ze, that's why it's Reshit. And this is for the very reason that blessed be the, the Almighty, the merciful one, who gave the Torah, he gave the Torah, which is compared to the first fruits, to the nation of God, which is compared to the first fruits. On the day of first fruits, he gave the first fruits of the Torah to the nation, which is the first fruits, on the day of first fruits. The word hibshilu is like, was not ripened. It usually means cooked. It's not yet cooked, not ready. It's not ready to eat, it's not ripened. Because before Matan Torah, the, the Eshkoliot in the Torah, I think it means the Torah itself. I'm sorry, I think it, mean, it could mean the people, right? The Avos kept the Torah, but they weren't fully ripened, so to speak. The Torah never changes. The Torah is always ripe. Ki Avos, 
even though they fulfilled the entire Torah, they only ate that was not yet ripe. Vihi keporachat alsa netza anayomaze. It was like a beginning of a flower. They were only flowering. They were beginning to blossom as people. That's what they were first fruits. But that's what they were in the beginning. They were just buds, right? They were not even full flowers yet. They were just coming up as buds. Kamo Yisrael shalobo leklal adam. Even the Jewish people did not yet come into the status of man until they stood their feet at Har Sinai, v'nistalka mehem zuhuma, and then was removed from the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, the impurities, shehizli nachash b'chava, that this is a middle of mystical, that the snake placed into chava in the Garden of Eden, that was removed from the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, as nigmar hapri, that's when the fruit became ripe at Mount Sinai. This is a Yom Bikurim. As it says in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 3. Uh, I think we read that one, sorry. Maybe it's Jeremiah 11. Right. It's Jeremiah 11, verse 16. A leafy olive tree fair with goodly fruit has the Lord called your name. Yofa pri toar korol Hashem shemecha. Okay, so that re- is referring to the idea that now we have reached the level of fruit, uh, ripe fruit, when we receive the Torah. And also, kemokein hator nimshal leitz chayim. The Torah itself is compared to what we call eitz chayim. This is number 17 on the, on the source sheet, Proverbs 3.18. It's called, it is a tree of life for those who grasp it and those who draw near to it are fortunate. Eitz chayim hi lemen chazikim bo v'tomchecha mu'ushar. And even though we didn't, um, okay, basically it's like this. Ashir piri yotem bi'ito. I skipped something. Kamo kein tor nimshal eitz chayim. So too the Torah is compared to this eitz chayim, this tree of life, which give off its fruit in its time. And he makes a very interesting statement. Vegetables you have to replant every year, but trees, they're there from year to year. What's the difference between this tree this year and next year? The fruits. That's the only difference. The tree is the Torah, and that's the same. So he says, Sha'ila Noita a planted tree, Mitzad Atzmo, from its own aspect, Eino Mishtana Mishana Shana. There's no difference between this planted tree from year to year. Zulata Pri except for the, the, the fruits that grow, Shabo mitchadesh b'kol shana. The fruits are new every year. There's new fruits every year. Kak gufa Torah lo tishtane b'shumzman. Therefore, the Torah itself doesn't change from time to time. Zulat pri. The only thing that changes is the pri. And how is he going to interpret the pri for us? Listen to these words. He says like this, that is the tamim, the chidushim, mitchachim, the Torah. That are the, those are the reasons that we delve deep in uh, into the Torah and come out with these novel ideas that we draw forth from the Torah. And that's why it says, going back to our original verse, that this on the day of the first fruits, ubiyom abi korim vehikri vechem mincha chadash Hashem, because the Torah itself needs to be like a new item, a new prototype. So bezret Hashem, this coming year, the Shavuos, we should really feel that we're it's Yom Adin, that our life depends on it, and we should carry this feeling through the year. And when we make novel ideas, when we come up with chidushim. And we, that's what we're, we're here for. Everybody has a letter in the Torah. And everybody's in Olam Katan, a unique universe. And we're all here to interconnect with each other and share these Torah ideas. Because I'll tell you the truth. The world is full of fake news. And this is the only thing that's real. Okay, this is the only thing that's real. And share Torah with as many people as you can. But you should be excited about it. I'm, like, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you what God wants. God wants you to feel excited as if you're intoxicated with the love of the Torah. And Bezrat Hashem, you'll continue to make chidushim and grow in your midos and grow in your Torah knowledge. And Bezrat Hashem will see the coming of the Mashiach. Bimher Bimeinu Amen Selah. Yeah, you're
Bye.